It's October 19th, 1998, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. It was today in history that young BBC viewers were treated to the surreal sight of head of children's programming Lorraine Hegacy appearing on their screens from an uber 90s office setup to explain that Richard Bacon would no longer be presenting children's tea time favourite Blue Peter because he had taken an illegal drug. And in a prim watch with mother voice, she said <laughs> that Bacon had not only let himself and the team on Blue Peter down, but has also let all of you down badly. I mean, this was an absolutely huge story at the time. And it is funny to look back on the outrage that it caused, considering this was a time when Rolf Harris and Jimmy Savile were both respected <laughs> children's broadcasters. Mm. But yes, this was concerning for the young viewers of Blue Peter, this stalwart veteran of churchy, goody-two-shoes children's broadcasting, <laughs> which had really stumbled into its first ever scandal yeah. uh, with this, which was the news of the world, tabloid muckraking Sunday paper, had found that one of the young presenters of the show, Richard Bacon, who was 22 at this point, had been snorting cocaine. And then he had to leave the show. And for Bacon, Blue Peter really was his first really big break. His first job was actually as a reporter for BBC Radio Nottingham. Uh, and then he went on to the now defunct live TV channel. I don't know anything about that. Perhaps you guys Can do. We- oh, oh. <laughs> clearly the subject of a future episode of The Retrospective. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I, don't, I almost don't want to ruin it, but I do want to say that one of its top programmes was called Topless Darts. <laughs> I mean, the point was... He was kind of edgy, which is why he'd got the job at Blue Peter. Like, he was there to inject a bit of spontaneous, youthful fun. But him actually taking Class A drugs was not what they wanted. (laughs) I mean, he'd he'd gone from a channel that involved a dwarf doing the weather forecast from a trampoline to (laughs) Blue Peter, where his usual assignments were things like he would go to Sandhurst and see what military discipline was like. So it was was really... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was quite a big change. You know, he was there when they unearthed Blue Peter's time capsule. You know, it really was like, if anyone is too young to remember Blue Peter or not from the UK, it was a mag- basically a magazine show for kids. It was very, very Blyton-esque. Most of the time... Talking these... about it in the past tense, Rebecca, it still exists on Blue CBBC. Blue still exists? Yeah. It still exists, yes. Did it take it... some kind of hiatus? I swear I remember a big finale episode. It's, it's not. It had its last broadcast on BBC One and no one's really watched it since then, but it does still exist, yes. <laughs> I don't think the new one can possibly be as squeaky clean as the old one. Blue Peter at its peak was famous for its craft. Charity fundraising. Charity fundraising. You'd have a little feature film about what's life like at Paint and Zoo. <laughs> I'm sorry, Arian, that we're talking all over you when no, you're about I'm... to contribute, but I, I do feel like as, as children of Britain, it's important yeah. that we explain this to you because the context... Is, I do think if this had happened even on another children's programme of the era it wouldn't have been so scandalous. It's because it was Blue Peter and its sort of village vicar way of talking to children over decades was yeah. its, one of its core brand values. Like, you'd watch Live and Kicking on a Saturday morning and you sort of assumed that Jamie Thigston and Zoe Ball were doing cocaine off each other. <laughs> and that was kind of the point. Was that They'd been out clubbing the night before and, hey, it's Saturday morning, we're all a bit hungover, aren't we, teenagers? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but Blue Peter was not that. It's actually quite helpful for me to understand why the tabloid coverage of this incident was so intensely salacious. Lots of the reports talk about Bacon as having gone on this 12-hour drinking binge. I'm like, 12 hours isn't like the longest of drinking binges. Like, quite a lot of people will go out in the evening and then come home the next morning and that will be 12 hours later. Like, that's not (laughs) a totally big deal. But, you know, in conjunction with, as you're saying, like his new the home that he found for himself and the career that he built for himself, or at least started building, I think he was only there for 18 months before this all happened, was based on this sort of squeaky clean image. And so I get now why that mattered so much. And that was reflected in the tone of the coverage as well. The News of the World's headline was so needlessly, aggressively gleeful and gloating. Yeah. The, <laughs> but that's the always the was, case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Blue Peter Goody Goody is a cocaine snorting sneak, which kind of sounds like something that Dennis the Menace would say in the Beano about <laughs> Sissy Walter. What a, what a strange thing to come at it. It's not like, it's not like Richard Bacon was the programme. They were so, they were crowing so intensely over this. Don't, don't forget the subheading, 12 hour drugs romp shame of kids. TV idol. <laughs> Honestly, I grew up reading these tabloids and I cannot believe I now have a job where I have to write words together. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
This was the 40th anniversary year of Blue Peter and the News of the World deliberately held this story back to cause maximum embarrassment and shame in that gleeful way that you describe. And that's why it was particularly acute, this embarrassment for the BBC, and also particularly hurtful for Richard Bacon. So what had happened was he had gone out with his best friend for a night. His best friend had then called him retrospectively and had a conversation with him on the phone in which he basically got him to repeat all of the things that they'd done. Oh, it was a great night, wasn't it? Oh, we took loads of coke, didn't we? And unbeknownst to Bacon... His best mate was taping that conversation in collaboration with the notorious publicist Max Clifford, who Uh, then sold it to the News of the World. That's how this got out. What a prick. (laughs) Yeah, so at this point he had no choice but to get ahead of the story and confess his sins to BBC bosses. And it seems like, actually, the painfully wholesome nature of Blue Peter wasn't totally a facade. You know, They weren't all going around doing drugs in nightclubs as soon as the cameras start rolling. Because when Blue Peter's content editor, Oliver McFarlane, heard about this, he apparently wasn't sure what cocaine was and thought it was something (laughs) people smoked (laughs) I mean the amazing thing is that Bacon really owned up to it and tried to move on with his career by being upfront and I think that that is hugely to his credit but one of the things that he's reflected on more recently is how much more terrifying this whole thing would have been to go through had it taken place in the age of social media specifically the barrage of people coming at him that, that just at the time you didn't really have to face I guess you could back then tune out the whole business by just not reading the newspapers not watching the news for a few days I'm not sure about this because I think there is a direct comparison as well it it wasn't too long ago that the mirror tried this trick on Ryland the Radio 2 presenter they had it wasn't even a photo or a video of him doing coke it was I think it was a clip and he sort of made a cheeky side that implied that he were that he had taken cocaine or he was going to take cocaine and they tried to do a proper old-fashioned news the world style you know (laughs) goody goody Radio 2 sneak or whatever but everyone on social media immediately just hit back saying who cares no one cares if he takes drugs. I mean, obviously, it's slightly different because he's not a children's TV presenter. But there was a real attitude of this is a classic tabloid trying to stitch up someone who's just living their life. And I'm not sure that this would have had the same reception today. Well, yes and no, because there was this incident that he recounted uh, in the last couple of years where his two children at the time, aged nine and seven, they worked out their dad was a celebrity and they decided to ask their Amazon Echo speaker who their dad was. And he said, I'm sitting in the next room in my house in Los Angeles. And and one of them asks, oh, Alexa, who is Richard Bacon? And it comes back straight away with, Richard Bacon is an English television presenter. He was fired from Blue Peter in 1998 for taking. And he said that he had to jump in immediately and go, (laughs) Alexa, stop, 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 stop. And, And, you know, I think that you can understand why this story still matters to him. You know, it's not just a a thing that's in the distant past and it wouldn't sort of matter in this present moment because it's still like the second thing on his autobiography as, you know, related by Amazon speakers. (laughs) Yeah, and he describes what happened next in his memoir which called a series on related events this incredible scene that's like something out of the Mitchell and Webb show he, he became the first Blue Peter presenter forced to hand over his badge mid-contract <laughs> and his he was gun literally yeah exactly <laughs> he was literally called into an office and he had to hand over his Blue Peter badge which was a very big deal at the time it was only worn by presenters and people who were considered worthy of this special honour including you know children who drew particularly good pictures that won competitions <laughs> etc you could get I think there was a rumour you could get into theme parks for free with them but I think it might have actually been more like National Trust properties. It seems more on brand. But yes, I mean, imagine as he slides the badge over the desk to his superior and sort of slinks out of the room. Busted down to traffic duty. (laughs) (laughs) Well, even though Bacon bounced back quite quickly from this scandal... He'll enjoy that Alan Partridge reference. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, Blue Peter itself was on the receiving end of some criticism for the way that they tackled it. I mentioned up top that... Lorraine Hegarty's address to the children was quite stilted and old-fashioned, and there was a feeling in some corners that they had missed the opportunity to have, you know, a more frank discussion. I saw this mm. incredible article in the Mirror from the time by Miriam Stoppard, who was saying just this and. Um, <laughs> was advising parents on how they might want to broach the subject of drugs to their kids. She says, do not be alarmist and paint too black a picture of drugs because kids know damn well that a lot of people take drugs without coming to harm. And so she suggests this incredible script. <laughs> Just one tablet could kill you or make you so ill you'll never recover. Children have died the first time they sniff glue or cleaning fluid because of a chemical in them that affects the brain. Sometimes these drugs can be like a terrible nightmare that never goes so away. A, yeah. a balanced, open-minded conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like sound advice. (laughs) Tomorrow. 
And also, it was this cheap and readily available form of rat killer. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.